Hey there! It's time to continue the series about C programming for the classic 68K Max. We're using Semantic C++ V6. If you're a first time watcher, then do check out the first video in the series, seeing as this is the second in this line. So what should we do today? Should we learn about doing menus? Doing scroll bars in Windows? Dialogue management? Nope! Let's make a game. A bad game, but still, a game. Boring stuff later. Stick around. Before we start, let's go over what aspects we want to build, what time-saving niceties will allow ourselves, and what expectations we can hold. The main objective is to have moving graphics, some control with the keyboard, some with the mouse, text score updating, and an easy to understand winning condition. It will be more into tech demo territory and come short of being a polished shareware game. But that's okay. This is only to get your feet wet and act as a baseline to let your creativity take over. Since this game making video is introduced so early in the series, we won't be making a full-fledged application with Macintosh guidelines, you know? with menus or even windows. It'll launch full screen and go straight to gameplay. Quitting will suddenly bring you back to Finder without a confirmation dialogue. Finally, you might be wondering why this whole thing is only in black and white. I kindly invite you to reread the title of my channel. Also, color brings an additional layer of complexity, which we don't need to burden ourselves with for now. I'm not saying we'll never do it, but let's keep our screen tied to a nice and simple 1 bit per pixel bitmap. Opening up a copy of the starter project file that was presented in the last video of the series. We recognize both the main and the my init stuff functions that were explained in depth last time. We don't need to mess with my init stuff, but if you're coming into the series fresh and need some explanations, go watch the fourth section of the first video. I like to keep the main function high level with as few lines of code as possible. I always follow this general advice in programming that if your function pushes, let's say above a hundred lines of code, you're probably overdoing it. You could be creating future technical depth if and when that function breaks down and you need to understand a problem emerging from it. Keeping this in mind and seeing as we want to do a quick and dirty game, these are the functions I'd add right away. Staging area. This is where you prepare the initial conditions of the game, load up your graphics and prepare your data. But could be leverage in a future program for a title screen, a menu and anything that happens before the gameplay starts. Main loop, acting as the core area where the gameplay occurs and which will be divided down in further steps. And finally, cleanup, which will tie loose ends, free memory, offer a dialogue, but we'll keep it minimal for this video. So the first thing we need to do is set up a graph port so that we can do anything graphical on the Macintosh. And the easiest way to do this is to just set up a new window. So if you don't remember exactly the parameters to do this, you just go over to Think Reference Viewer, which is a very useful tool uh, that lets you navigate the references and the functions of the Macintosh toolbox. So we just type new window here and it gives you all the parameters you need. And there's always or very often an example at the end of any page. So we actually saw that uh, in the previous video of the series. So let's recap. We need the rectangle, let's call it R. So the next line would be new window and we would set up that window and just forget about it uh, until the end of the program because we don't need multiple graph ports, just the one. So first parameter would be nil. I don't need to store the window record as is seen here. Then we send it the address of the rectangle, which will keep uh, the area that we need to do graphics in. This rectangle can also be used to wipe out the whole screen by filling it with a special pattern like white. 
Next, we have the title of the screen, but it won't show up. So we need to send it a Pascal code for the string length, which is backslash p, and it doesn't matter what we type as a title. So let's just put some gibberish. And then we set up the visible flag, which will be true. And then the window type. Uh, in here, I just need a white space, so just plain D box. If you are wondering what kind of types of windows we could use, well, we can just click on Thinker Reference Viewer and just find them. If we scroll down, we can see a list of types of windows here. You can click on specifics. And you can see some graphical examples of the different types of windows, which you recognize from various Macintosh applications. And one cool thing about Think Reference Viewer is you can go back to the previous page you were, you were viewing, like so. Next parameter is not really useful right now, so let's just set it to minus one L. It's supposed to point uh, to another window, which we don't have here but it would point to the window under which the current window you're trying to create will go behind. So th since there's no other windows, we just select minus one L. And then we need a go away flag. Let's set it to false. And then a uh, ref gone, which we don't need to go into, just set it to zero here. So let's just try the application right now, save, uh, I do command K to compile, no error, and command R to run. And here we have, uh, we have a big white space as intended, but I actually didn't define a rectangle, so I kind of got lucky here. One way would be to find how a rect variable is set up, just type rect here, and you can see that uh, if you click here, there are four shorts that define the top, the left, the bottom, and the right. But the best way to set these is to use a special function, which is called set rect, which is right here. And you have to respect the, the order of things here. So if I wanted a rectangle that's the size of a Mac Plus screen, then I would need to send it the address of R, then uh, we start with the left, so zero, the top zero, the right 512, and the bottom 342. Let's try that. And it works. Here is a Mac Plus sized screen, but here I'm using Basilisk 2 and the resolution is higher than this. So how would you set up the rectangle uh, to take the maximum space? Well, pretty easy. Instead of using that function, we could do just R equals QD, which stands for quick draw. It's a global that's very useful. It lets you access a lot of low level parameters uh, for your environment and graphical wise. So QD dot the port, uh, then an arrow to access a member pointed by this pointer port bits bounds, which is itself a rectangle. So it just copies over its content to R. Let's delete this. Let's try it out. And yes, the rectangle takes the whole space here. You'll notice that there's still a menu space, uh, which we can disable, but it's going to be part of an, a future video. Let's keep it simple for now. Okay. So let's think strategically on a high level. We should totally define some globals in order for the various functions to communicate with each other with a common ground. So when I defined the rectangle here in the staging area, I really want it as a global instead. So let's paste some of the stuff here in the global variables area, which is near the top of the file. And I should need all of these. So let's think about as a very simple game where there you control a player with the keyboard and you need to move it to a goal area, which is going to be defined by a rectangle as well. So I need coordinates for X and Y for the player. I need a speed as well because it has to move around. It has to animate and the goal is going to be another rectangle. Let's keep it very, very simple. And maybe there's a score and you should define a rectangle for each of the elements here. So these could be bounding areas for later 
uh, if you think of the characters and enemies as sprites. But uh, we're not going to use sprites here, just the rectangle and just fill it with a pattern. So now that the rectangle is a global, we can remove it here in the staging area. So R has been declared as a global earlier and it gets defined here and there's no problem at all. So let's uh, initialize some of the other globals that we talk about. Let me paste initial values here. Let's start a player at a very easy location that would work on any screen. So 200 for X, 150 for Y, no speed at the beginning because that would look strange. And then if we want the player to actually show up as a, let's say a black rectangle, we would need these lines. So the coordinate would tr keep track of the top left uh, point of the rectangle. This is the line that defines the player rectangle. This is the left, the top, the right. So this means it's 16 pixels wide. And this is the bottom, which means it's 32 pixels high. So this line fills the rectangle with a black pattern so we can see it on the white backdrop. Let's just run it to see it. Very cool, we see our black rectangle. Let's populate the main loop for a bit. So I will need additional functions. Uh, it should deal with the input from the keyboard. It should deal with the graphics. And it should deal with the game logic to find the winning condition, update the score, and these sorts of things. So whenever you intend to use new functions such as these, you need to define the function declarations here. So let's just paste. And there we go. Let's indent them a bit because it can show that they are part of main loop here. I think we're ready for some interactivity in order to make it a game. I'm going to start with deal input, but first let's put the function definitions here. If you read on Macintosh C programming, you're going to be steered most likely with functions such as wait next event or get next event. And these work pretty simply and you can see it in think reference viewer. The way this works is that you basically decide which kind of event you need. And by default, you could just pick every event, which uh, doesn't discriminate against any type. And you basically collect the data in an event record, which if you click here, uh, it's broken down into what kind of event it is, uh, what information or data is part of the event when did it occur where did it occur and are there modifiers and this is pretty good and dandy but doesn't really work for games so this is you have to kind of go out of your way outside of the normal documentation in order to do a game implementation of inputs so the way this works is to use get keys which is this thing. And if you scour the web, you might stumble upon the very useful Glypha 3 source code. And if you don't know what Glypha is, it's a classic Macintosh game from the 90s made by John Calhoun, who incidentally made a remake, a modern remake on Steam of that game. If we're talking about the old school game from the 90s, well, the whole source code is present, you can verify for yourself at this link that the game code actually uses get keys. It kind of provides a more immediate feedback. It doesn't wait for an event to occur and populate itself and it's more reactive. And on top of this, you can easily do combinations of certain key presses, not all of them, but many of them. So it's good enough for games for now. I want to react to A and D for a classic WASD control scheme. So let's just paste a bunch of code here. So I'm going to get the key map with the function get keys. I have to define a global call the key. So let's just do this right now in under my globals key map the keys. 
So my first conditional is if I have pressed the A key, the player's speed in the X axis should go to minus. And if I have pressed D, the, uh, it should be in the positive. Remember that what we aim to change is not the coordinates, but it's the rate of change of the coordinate. So KA and KD should be defined symbols associated with the keyboard key codes. In Think Reference Viewer, you can type keyboard character codes. And if we just select maybe Mac plus keyboard, you can see this layout with the codes that you need to use. So we can see these symbols, 0, 0 for A, 0, 1 for S, 0, 2 for D, and OD for W, which stands for 13. So I'm going to go at the top of my file here and just paste them here in the define list right there. So the way that get keys work is kind of complicated. You have to really dive deep into a 128 bit wide array where every key is represented by one space in that array. So when you press a certain key, uh, one of the values changes to one and by default they're all at zero. So we have to test a very specific area in the array and you can do some combinations if you want as well. So suffice to say, let's just use the documentation and let me show you how it looks. So this code right here, short is pressed. You send it your keyboard code that you just saw a few moments ago and it treats it just right and returns true if it has been pressed. So it uses bit shifting operations. It has to go at a certain place in the, the array that I talked about. It has to shift the result <laughs> a few more times. So, so it's pretty complicated. You could map it out on a piece of paper. I've tried after five minutes, I just abandoned and just uh, took the function as is and it works very well. I'm going to just paste this thing and call it a day. <laughs> I'm going to paste it right at the bottom like so, and not forget to as well define the function here at the top with the others. So let's compile and save and everything still works. So we have to actually make the speed change matter. So this is going to be done in graphics. Let's just put it at the end of input. So we update the player position according to the speed here. I know I haven't messed with the Y information, but it's going to be good for later. And for those changes to actually matter, we have to deal with the graphics and redraw our rectangle according to the new information here. So I'm just repeating what I've done in the staging area. Let's try it. All right, so I'm filling the screen. <laughs> um, and what I actually need is that if I move, I have to erase the previous position. And here we should notice that my keyboard strokes that I was pressing during gameplay are going to be written in semantic thing C++. So I don't want that. I want the events to only matter during the game. So let's solve this right now because it's pretty annoying when you program some games. So you should go to clean up here and just use the function flush events. Uh, just tell it to take every kind of events so it's going to capture the keyboard inputs and the second parameter has to be written as zero so let's try that let's move a bunch of times and it sh it should not add these characters these rogue characters in my code now and as such no they're they're not here so let's try again and put a lot of them And here you go, row characters again. So let's uncomment this. All right. So this will wipe out the current position. Then it will update the rectangle and then it will write it as black as it should be. So we have a couple of problems to solve here. Um, as you can see, the animation is too fast and it goes out of bounds. So we have to do two solutions. We have to restrict 
the movement of the rectangle and then we have to do something about the smoothness or uh, make it slower or something so right after I updated the position of the player I could do these restrictions Remember that the player X and Y coordinates are relative to the top left of the rectangle. So if it tries to go below zero in X, let's force it to stay at X equals zero. If it tries to go too far to the right, uh, which would be when it tries to go above the value of R dot right, which is the rightmost bound of the whole screen rectangle. But let's subtract 16 because let's not forget that the rectangle is 16 pixels wide and similar restrictions for Y. Let's try to see what happens. So we have a bounded rectangle. This works. Now let's add the controls for Y. Like so, so it reacts to W to go up. So you remember that going up is subtracting Y coordinates and going down is adding Y co coordinates. So this would affect the player speed just like in the X coordinate. Let's try it. All right, so I have my WASD control scheme and it's going too fast. So let's solve that problem. Going back to my global variables, I'm going to set up two new parameters, a movement cooldown and a movement dial. Let's start them at 20. So this is one way of doing things. There may be others, but let's try this out. So I'm going to surround everything that pertains to changing the coordinates of the player, and I'll only change it when it goes uh, once every 20 loops. So I'm going to use my movement dial here, uh, variable, and when this is equal to zero, remember I set it at 20 initially. So let's indent everything here that pertains to updating and let's end this block of code. Uh, and whenever this is reaches zero, I'm going to reset it at 20. And I'm using movement cooldown as my reference point to go back to 20. I, if, if it's too fast, if it's too slow, I can change it. And if it's not equal to zero, let's decrement it. So it's going to try to register key press every time, every time it goes through this whole function, which happens once per loop but it's actually not going to update the, the position if the movement dial is not equal to zero. If it is equal to zero, it's gonna do everything, change the position, uh, check for restrictions, and also bring the movement dial back to 20, the initial value. So this happens once every 20 loop passages, and this happens otherwise. Let's try it. So you can see in my emulator, it's going at a respectable speed. Normally you would bind these uh, according to the clock, according to some amount of milliseconds, and it would try to do the same across every kind of Macintosh. But let's, let's be content with this quick and dirty way for now. As it stands now, the game is pretty boring. There's nothing to do, but let's change that. Let's go to the staging area. We should set a goal for the game. So let's call it literally set new goal as a function. And then I have to go up in the function declarations and add that as well. And the goal is basically going to be another rectangle that you have to roll over. So it should look something like this. So remember in my previous in my previous global variables, I had set up space for a goal X and goal Y, and I should pick a random location. It should be bounded horizontally by zero on the left and R dot right minus 20. Let's create a 20 by 20 tangle. And this is a function that doesn't exist. We'll create it as well. So this function was lifted from think reference. Uh, they actually give out this exact code. So it's pretty nifty because you can set up a minimum value and a maximum value. You're not, you're not forced to start your random number at zero like in other contexts for, for programming. 
And let's not forget to put the function declaration as well. Let's try it out. And there you go. I chose a dark gray pattern. It shows well. If I try to move over it, it's going to paint over because it's part of my, my uh, loop, which uh, as part of my graphics, I'm painting white to remove the previous locations of the player. So it's normal. And just for fun, we should uh, put a better pattern for this. Uh, let's change this. We could set up a pattern variable, which I'll call my pat, and change the fill rect with this pattern. And if you want to sift over the pattern from uh, the system environment, you can do this with this function, which is called get end pattern, which stands for indexed pattern. And basically, you can pick the regular patterns you might remember from Mac Paint. I'm going to select 37 because uh, when I was a kid, I called that a blueberry pie filling. So let's go for that. So this function will uh, select pattern 37 and put it in my pat. And then we'll, we're using this to fill the rectangle. Let's try it out. And there you go. Uh, it kind of looks bad because I selected a 20 by 20 area. So let's frame it with a black border. And it turns out there's a function just for this, which is called frame rect. Just set it the, the rectangle goal rect and you're done. And it looks much nicer now. So now we have to add some logic. When the player rectangle overlaps the goal rectangle, it should count as, it should progress the game, like uh, increase your score or something. And let's create a dumb condition when you reach a score over three, it quits the game right away. So let's try that. Remember, we set up a space for this, which is uh, visited every loop. It's in deal logic. That's where it should go. And uh, the code should look something like this. There's a, uh, there's a function that uh, checks for overlaps for rectangles. Let's check it out. It's sect rect for intersect rectangles. And you actually have to send three parameters. The address for rectangle one, address for rectangle two. And there's also a, an address for a result rectangle, which would carry the intersection space between the two. We're not using it really just want the function to return true if there an intersection was found and false if it wasn't. So that's what's happening here with the third parameter. I'm not collecting the data back for the intersected zone. If you remember, I put a global variable for score so we can increment it, check if we go over three. And if we do, we go to the cleanup function. But the other thing that has to happen when an intersection is going on is we should remove this goal rectangle and paint it white but that's probably going to paint a part of the player white as well so we just have to refresh and touch up the player rectangle in black and set a new goal and since we set up a function for that we don't need to redefine the exact amount of lines uh, which is a problem in a long program if you're doing uh, lots of things in many places that are repeating Whenever you want to change it, it's really painful to find every area where these functions are performed. So it's better to do it once in a well-labeled area, such as new set new goal function here. So in order to quit the game, we have to add a function which is called exec to shell, which will bring you back to the finder and quit your game. Let's try that out. One, two three and four it quit success so i want to go over some loose ends and some polish that we could add to this actually when you control for horizontal movement there should be a way to stop movement if you're not pressing any key so it should be a conditional which is reach if none of the a or d key is pressed so it's an otherwise, uh, just set the player speed to zero. The same should be done for Y movement. So if W or S are not pressed, you should stop the whole Y movement. Another thing that bothers me is when we do the graphic for the player, it has actually been done in two places. 
it should only be editable from only one area. So let's do a function for this. In the same vein as set new goal, we should do a draw player, which accepts no argument. We should move these two lines in this new function and call that function from that place as well as in the staging area. Replacing these two lines. And let's not forget to declare that kind of function here. And there we go, void. Another thing we should watch out is that it runs great in the emulator, but I don't know about the conditions of a real Mac. So what happens if I bring it to Macintosh Plus? We should parameterize this. If you remember, I kind of moderated the speed with a movement dial cooldown parameter. Instead of hard coding it to 20, I could set it to a value that I can easily change at the top of the source code. So I define a global cooldown parameter. And I change my two variables to that. Still working. Let's try to change the parameter. I can also test the absence of movement when I let go of a key. What happens if I put the cooldown at 10? Moves a little faster. Let's try 100. Very slow. And we'll test it out on real machines in a few moments. For this video, I'm going to wrap things up here. But I'm going to talk about what could be done in the next steps in the next video. We could tidy up the source code and put some of the functions that we know we're going to reuse in other projects in separate source code files. And we could add them back here in the project file list. Functions such as the ranged random or the is pressed. To deal with this flickering, we'll do a technique called sync on vertical blanking. This makes sure that the pixels being drawn are not anywhere close to where the scan line of the screen is currently operating on. And third, as I mentioned earlier, we need to do the timing of the animation and the game speed in a smarter way than just estimating the delay parameter which is seen here. So let me compile a version where I pick the default 20 that I started with in the emulator. Let's write 20 in the application name. And let me quickly compile another version where the delay is only one. So it's going to update the position of the player every other loop passage. Let me give it another name. So I'm going to transfer over to my real Mac Plus and test those out. So it runs well on a Mac Plus, it's pretty slow. Another way to increase the speed would just be to make the speed, instead of incrementing the position only by one, it could increment by two or something else. So there are ways to fine tune it. And I'm not gonna subject you to, <laughs> the winning condition here is way too slow. It's time to recap what has been achieved here. A graphic area was set up. A skeleton but working game engine was put together. Actual gameplay design decisions were made. In the next few videos, we'll build on the same example and make the flicker go away. And also improve on the graphics. I'll also share how to import graphics from a modern machine all the way down to a type of image that can be used here. I hope you consider to stay tuned for all of that. See you next time.